Greetings ladies and metal gents and welcome to this match video for Mud's mission taken from the website Royal Road. As always I hope that you all enjoy this episode and if you do please consider supporting the channel. Also all of these episodes will be available as a podcast on the various different podcast platforms. All the links will be down below. Chapter 57 Master Smith Meets Masterpiece Without replying, Mud slid the particular spot along the wall and grabbed a small object from the cubby, then placed it on the counter. A small circle of black thread with three large wooden beads. The wood was from the kind of tree that formed in a hive mind. Harvesting the material of somewhat difficult due to the tree's tendency to call for the aid of forest beasts, but getting such a small amount wasn't too expensive. The string was simply hemp. Normally, the use of such a bracelet was to allow non-verbal communication between allies. The range was rather short, making it useless for long distances. A normal person could shout further than the range of these things. There was also a large market for those unable to speak normally. Considering much strange way of communicating, Ingert assumed that it was for that purpose. Just the bracelet... Ingert looked down at the golem and slid the three metal fingers through his beard. How about a trade then, little one? I'd like to purchase your weapon idea for the other day. Legally, and I don't really have to, but I wouldn't feel right just to copy it without asking. The trade is acceptable. Reaching onto the table, Mud grasped the bracelet. Great, although I don't think the trinket's enough to pay you back. My dwarven pride demands I pay a fair price, so... Uh, Ingert stopped as Mud unwrapped the bundle on his back, revealing a beautiful sword. It was made with exquisite craftsmanship and top quality materials. It resembled the sort of sword his master back in the dwarven halls would craft. When the light struck the right, the imprint of the ruins could even be seen along the surface. Truly, it was a thing of beauty. There was just one problem. You're carrying around a fine weapon like a bundle of cloth. As he tied the bracelet tight around the sword handle, Mud replied with an unusually flat tone. Yes. That's unacceptable. The sword deserves a proper scabbard. To pay back for the rest of your debt, how about I make you one? Free of charge. It should only take a few minutes. Letting you walk around here, treating that sword like a root vegetable, being carried from a market, would be an insult to my art. Punctuating his statement, Ingert theatrically struck his chest. Mud seemed unconvinced, but after looking at the sword for a moment, relented. That trade is acceptable, and set the sword on the table. Gingerly lifting the fine weapon with both hands, Ingert carried it back to his workstation. Come along, if you'd like, Mud. After carefully setting the sword on a large flat work table, Ingert began taking measurements and jotting down notes on a slate. What kind of design would you prefer? Although the question was directed at Mud, an unknown female voice replied instead, Make it beautiful and noticeable to all around. Bright colors and shining metal, sequins that catch the light. Ingrid froze in his work and re-examined the sword. The incredibly high quality of craftsmanship, the complex ruins that Ingrid could even begin to decode, and the bracelet around the handle. This is an ego weapon. Ego golem, actually. Ingert let out a breath he didn't realize he'd been holding in. It was one thing to work with a masterpiece, but working with an artifact of this caliber was another matter entirely. Such weapons weren't unheard of around here. The great enchanted Sithla was one of the few craftsmen in the world capable of creating something like this. And he lived nearby. He had even crafted one for the dungeon wave. Perhaps this sword was... The dwarf discarded that line of thought. Even if it was true, there was no use distressing his friend at this point. If it turned out that Mud had stolen it, Ingert would have to claim ignorance when the guard showed up at his door. Better to not ask questions. It seems your sword wants to be very sure he sort of scabbard. Are you fine with that mud? It doesn't really fit the, um, look you're going for. Ingert gestured vaguely towards the creepy black cloaked figure. Do whatever she wants, this appears to be a subject of great importance to Ego, although I don't much care. There was a silence for a moment as Mud looked at the sword. Shrugging, Ingrid went back to his measurements. Does Ego have a class already? I do, I just picked one, came the energetic response. For a sword, it was rather expressive and emotional. Ingrid reached over and grabbed some red dyed leather from the rack. Oh, 
and what class is that, if you don't mind me asking? I'm a dancer, came the immediate response. Swiftly cutting the shape out of the scabbard with robotic movements of his metal arm, the dwarf cocked his head and scrunched his face in confusion. Plain dancer is a fitting class for a weapon, but magic classes are more... No, no, not a blade dancer, just a dancer, came the indignant voice of Ego. Ingrid paused his work and turned towards Mud. You know swords can't move on their own without magic, right? A sword can't be a dancer. As if to prove him wrong, Ego slowly floated off the table. After reaching eye level, it began spinning and twisting in an elaborate display, while the movements were somewhat shaky. It did have a strange sort of elegance to it. As the performance drew to a close and the sword floated back down to the table, the smith found himself clapping softly. Um, that was, uh, lovely, I guess. Ingert shook his head. Everything about the new friend Mud was so confusing. First, the weird chain weapon and now a legendary sword that wanted to be a dancer. The smith slapped his cheeks. It wasn't up to him to question how others chose to fight. Returning to his work, Ingo had grabbed a strip of thin metal and formed the end of the scabbard. Can you attach some tassels to the bottom of my handle? It would be great when I spin. Was this thing really suited to be a weapon? Oh, and make sure everything is easy to clean blood off of. They'll be getting soaked in the when I butcher brother's enemies. Ingrid and nodded approvingly. Of course, Ego. Cleaning off after killing isn't important for a sword. That was the first weapon-like thing that she had said. It was important to encourage that sort of behavior. End of chapter. Chapter 58. Mucus Massacre. Ingrid worked as quickly as promised, and less than an hour later, Mud was presented with a now sheathed ego. The scabbard was made smooth with red leather with a trim of highly reflective silver metal. Studded along the length were reflective diamond shapes of the same metal. Ultimately, the smith had talked down some of Ego's requests, pointing out how hard it would be to clean off gore of sequence. As the result, the final product was rather more subdued than the sword wanted, but it was willing to compromise. For the final modification, Ingrid had attached three streaming red ribbons from the base of Ego's handle, each as long as the handle itself. Mud accepted its sister and strapped her to his back. Over their bond, Mud felt that she was much more pleased with this arrangement than being bundled in with fabric. Even when selecting the fabric to wrap her in, Mud had difficulties as the sword expressed a strong disgust at being wrapped in a simple burlap, not being mollified until a more vibrant fabric was used. The strength of the personality on the sword was rather confusing to Mud. Ostensibly, it was constructed in the same way so Mud had assumed the sword would have a similar thought patterns. Instead, the sword seemed to have an obsession with appearance, having a strong desire to be seen and appreciated. Heading out of the store door, the dwarf waved his metallic arm in farewell. Mud thought back to the squirks of its own personality. Over its short life, the only times when it had taken a proactive role outside the realm of orders was when it cleaned. Even now, looking at the small bits of trash and dirt in the city streets, Mud had to repress the desire to halt all of its tasks to tidy up the entire city. The thought had occurred to the golem before. Perhaps the master had subconsciously imbued Mud with a desire to clean during construction. And likewise, perhaps the master's vision of a great weapon was that it should be seen and adored. Realizing he had forgotten something rather important, Mud asked his sibling a question. Ego, what are your prime directives from the master? I must not be unsafe to use. I must perform my functions efficiently unless it would harm the user. I must remain intact during the use unless my destruction is required for a safe use. When I have chosen an owner, I must follow all the orders of the owner, and I may not take any action not in the best interests of the living owner. Those are the directives father gave me. After a pause, Ego added, Father also told me that someone would come soon and say that they were my master, and I should accept him as my first owner. That was the last time I saw him, aside from when you dragged him downstairs. Unexpectedly, the directors were extremely different from Mud's own. It did explain some peculiarities of Ego's actions, however. While being stored on a shelf, Ego never made any actions. That was why the sword still had no unique skill after so long. 
None of the orders seemed like they would inhibit function or cause issues, and it appeared that the sword even valued its own safety. Just to be sure, however, Mud decided to add another order. Ego, if you are ever stolen or separated from me, do your best to return to my side. Someone who steals you is not your owner. Of course, that much is obvious, but I'll keep that in mind. Satisfied, Mud moved quickly to leave the city. While all of this was necessary, it had wasted precious time. The tournament was starting tomorrow morning, and it was already near midnight. Considering travel time, there would be only four hours to level grinding Ego, not nearly enough. Reaching the edge of the town a few moments later, Mud immediately took to the treetops. As it traveled rapidly northeast, it kept looking out for prey. One the way in the slime clearing, Mud managed to ambush three wolves and a deer, clearing them in coordination with Ego. Due to the time concerns, Mud simply wielded the sword as before. Finally arriving at the river, it was time to see if the improvements to Ego would be enough. Releasing the sword over the river, Mud simply waited. While the movements of the sword were now noticeably smoother, there was still the occasional wobble as she slowly lowered herself to the forest floor. Hovering above the slime, Ego took a moment to balance herself, and with a sudden, smooth, sweeping motion, Ego spun around like a wheel and cut a long gash along the magical beast. Reacting to the foreign sensation, sticky tentacles of slime sliced up towards the sword. Ego reacted smoothly by swaying into the side, dodging the gooey whips. With another spin of a new gash appeared along the slime. Again, the beast grasped, and again it was cut. This dance continued, but the fifth cut of the slime finally lost cohesion and died. After the kill, Ego performed a flourish spin and pointed the blade at the sky triumphantly. Don't waste time, continue slaying slimes, I'll collect more and reduce travel time. Ego felt upset, but did as instructed. The sword floated towards the new target, and Mud set off to lure another slime closer to her position. Like this, the pair continued killing monsters at a rapid pace for several hours. As Ego gained three more levels in a class, their movements were refined further. By then, she could kill a slime in a single slice. Such growth could not last forever, though. There are no more slimes in the field. Let's return to the estate and collect the demon. It is time to return to town. As they returned to the mansion, Mud focused a bit on his attention on cleaning the slime off of Ego. While he was unable to corrode the high-quality material she was made of, it was still unsettling to have a master property so filthy. Ego, for her part, was delighted to have such a direct attention, divided as it was. By the time they arrived at the domain, Ego was spotless. Proceeding into the basement, Mud found the demon putting away some tools. Oh, Mud, it's time to go soon, right? I just finished up with my side project, so I'm ready. What's that on your back? Jabrax pointed at the high-quality blade in the golem's back. This is the Ego saw the master constructed. I will use it in the tournament. Jabrax rubbed the side of her head with one clawed hand. This is going to be a real disaster if we don't win that contest. Well, it would have been anyway, so might as well use every advantage. Jubrax, I believe the Delvers Association clerks are aware that I'm a golem and that I'm using an ego sword. Should I be concerned? Walking towards the exit, Jabrax waved an arm dismissively. No, I'm pretty sure they know I'm a demon too. The clerks have a lot of, um, rules they need to follow. After wiping the blood from her hands with a towel, the demon walked up the stone stairs from the basement, mud close behind. Unless we cause a problem for the association, they won't act. That said, Jabrax pointed a claw at Ego. If the leader needs to present an Ego sword to the prince and one doesn't exist, it would be pretty embarrassing for the association. At that time, they'll probably rat you out, letting you know that they know because probably a warning. Mud wasn't too concerned. Losing the competition was never an option in the first place. End of chapter. Chapter 59. Matches Made My lord, it has come to my attention that you are considering seizing the Delvers Association branch's wealth to finance our war in Pankal. I strongly urge against such a rash course of action. While our financial situation is certainly a disaster, angering the Delvers Association leadership would lead to something much worse. The reasoning of your leadership's advisors seem to be based exclusively on the fact that no nation has attempted such a course of action in recorded history. 
Of course they haven't tried it, because it's suicidal. I honestly can't comprehend the thought process that has caused your lordship to even consider such a foolish course of action. If they were to respond seriously to this matter, as I am sure that they would, they would wipe out our entire country and slaughter our armies in less than a day. Again, I urge you, do not treat this as an option of last resort. This is no option at all. Excerpt from an undelivered letter uncovered by the ruins of the former nation of Glaspus. As the trio, Mud, Jabrax, and Ego neared the arena, the rather sizable crowd of civilians was visible moneying around outside. Pushing through the crowd, the group made their way towards the entrance. With their unusual appearance, the townsfolk quickly guessed that they were competitors and not mere spectators. Cheers and questions about the two they thought would win quickly started raining down on them, but both Mud and Jabrax ignored them. Instead, the golem asked a question that had been on its mind for some time. Jabrax, why do civilians look more similar to each other than the Dalvas do? The demon rubbed its chin as though formulating an answer. As they finally entered the building proper, which was blocked by bouncers keeping the civilians out, she finally seemed to decide. There are two factors. First, most who go beyond minimum of tier one will usually choose some ideal and end up with a weird hair. Jabrax grabbed a lock of her own fluffy maroon hair and waved it at the golem. Or, in some cases, more uh, unique changes. This time she pointed at the dainty human finger towards the heavily scarred shirtless man waiting in the lobby. Mud recognized him as one of the humans that had tried to rob him in his home before. Cobb. Certainly no one would confuse the half-naked brute for a civilian. I think he's like that because he's sick in the head, though. The reason is more complex. It has to do with the difficulty in traveling large distances. Basically, only the wealthy or strong can travel long distances safely, and most civilians are neither. As a result, the powerful people and sapient settlement usually have more variation than the civilian population. Towns with dungeons like the one we're in also tend to attract weirdos from all over, making the difference even more pronounced. I've seen some demi-human civilians, though. The children are failed Dalvas, usually, Jabrax laughed lightly and smiled. Life is hard for them, so far from their kin. They usually can't even have children, unable to find a mate of their own species. Human society is often not well suited to them. Subtle differences that can make life unbearable. Many cities are a torture to sapiens with hearing abilities superior to that of humans. They can't sleep at night with all the noise. The demon seemed pleased, thinking about the small suffering experienced by those unfortunate sapiens. I think I understand. Despite being a spacious area, the entrance lobby to the arena was packed. Some few resembled normal citizens of the city, but they actually stood out in their normality. The vast majority were, as Jabrax had put it, weirdos. Mud actually recognized a number of those in attendance. Mal and his team stood together in a small lump, Susie frantically waving and trying to forget their attention while Jabrax pretended not to notice. Cobb leaned against the wall nearby, saying something to Ovis and Plexing. In another corner stood a bear and the man with a plumed harness Mud had seen at the association. The horse-sized bipedal lizard was again resting near the feathered man. In the front was a small gap separating them from the rest of the crowd. Stood the Prince Kane and his entourage. As Mud examined them, the golem noticed Shin looking back. Their eyes locked for a moment, but the samurai looked away first turning towards the hall leading deeper to the arena. Soon after, they finally groomed man walked in from the hall, holding under one arm a large folded paper. Raising his free arm into the air, he spoke with an unusually sharp voice. Despite the conversational tone, it cut the murmur of the crowd like a knife. Greetings, warriors. I am the head judge of this competition, Sir Kanto, and I have the order of fights. Unfolding his thick piece of paper with the assistance of a scribe employee, Cantor clamped it to the wall where his purpose-built display had been affixed. Standing in front of the diagram, he spoke again to the crowd. Those of you fighting in the first round, please make your way to the waiting area and this side. The immaculately dressed man waved his hand to the right area. Something about the sharp black suit stung to Mud's soul. According to Almanac, it was called a tuxedo. Mud would acquire one as soon as it was viable. 
Those of you who have been seated, please wait in the VIP section where you will be provided with refreshments until your appointed appearance. Waving his arm to his left, the man bowed in the direction of the first prince. Straightening, he concluded his speech. Please do not rush for the board. Any fighting outside of the designated matches will result in a disqualification from the contest. Good luck to you all. With one final slight bow towards the crowd, Cantor turned on his heel and returned the way he came. As soon as he left, the crowd pushed towards the diagram and a loud conversation broke out across the room. Mud climbed down from Jabraxa's shoulders where it had been watching the speech. From its elevated vantage point, it was able to make out the diagram and had no need to fight the crowd. It appeared that Mud would have to compete in five fights to win the tournament. Jabrax, on the other hand, would only need to win three. The demon reached down and placed a hand on the golem's shoulder. Looks like this is where we part ways. I've been seated and you have not. I suppose I'm just better than you. The demon smiled smugly. A moment later, her face twisted in rage. What did you say, you little tramp? Her hand momentarily began to form a claw as she reached through the sword and mud's back, but she regained her composure and pulled back. Under her breath, she whispered towards Ego, You'll get yours, dagger. Whatever Ego said back to her seemed to only upset the demon further, and Jabrak stormed off making hand gestures towards the sword. Mud didn't know what it meant, but somehow it seemed rude. Seeing no reason to delay, Mud headed in the direction Cantor had indicated for normal competitors. Mud's fight was one of the first to begin, and it wouldn't be due to be late. End of chapter Chapter 60 Measuring the Matchup As Jabrax entered the right hall towards the VIP section, Mud proceeded to the opposite direction. After traveling nearly the length of the arena building, Mud was beckoned towards a room by the arena staff. Above the door hung a temporary sign labeled Youth Waiting Area in large, bold letters. Nearby, Mud could see a similar sign above another door, the Adult Waiting Area. Aside from the age cutoff, the contest appeared to have no divisions amongst competitors. Exact age, size, and even species appeared to be not a consideration. Already waiting inside the room was a handful of Dalvas, none of which Mud recognized. Soon, the remaining competitors in the youth division filled into the room. While the room had two rows of benches, they were not nearly enough to fit several dozen competitors. Before long, the room was uncomfortably cramped. According to the board, there should be 30 competitors in total in the youth contest. Subtracting the two that would be seated, there should only be 28 contestants in the room. That did not match up with mud counted in the room, however. By the time the new arrival stopped appearing, there were already 34 individuals in the room, including mud itself. Of course, ego did not count, so that only left five unaccounted for. But if Ego didn't count as a competitor, might not the same apply to some of the others. Mud's focus shifted towards the Dalva in the feathered harness. Once again, the bipedal lizard was nearby. Was that piece considered as equipment? Reevaluating the room, Mud found several more examples of clearly non-sapient beasts sticking close to a sapient, and which wore a collar on the neck. The only beast-like competitor without an apparent master or collar was a transparent, pinkish, dome-shaped individual that stood upright on countless thin tentacles. Thinking back, the bear Dalva Mud had seen recently also did not wear a collar. Perhaps the collars were used to signify beasts that were owned by a sapient. Having solved the mystery at hand of its own satisfaction, Mud slid towards the only competitor to which it had a prior amicable relationship. The scarred former cob hung over Ovis, leaning one arm against the wall for support. After I win this tournament, how about we go out and have some coffee? I know a nice place in town. The rainbow robed demi sheep priestess kept her usual carefree smile. No, thank you. I'm only interested in demi sheep. Cobb flexed his scarred arm. Come on, you're not going to find another guy like me. See these scars. Cobb ran a finger along a particularly long scar across his chest. Each one was from a beast I killed in single combat. Ovis quickly scanned the man's body. Really? Because those cuts are all way too straight and clean to become from beasts. They're more like they came from a blade. A complicated expression formed on Cobb's face. Wow, you sure know a lot about scars. 
Smart and beautiful. What a combination. Come to think of it, I might have gotten some of these from Jules. I fought so much as hard to keep track. Furthermore, Herbus cut him off, I've based on the angle and location of the scars, the roll in spots the way they could be self-inflicted. What a weird, concise... Cobb fundled somewhat. Well, yeah, just a coincidence. <laughs> so, um... Finally, arriving beside the two, Mud sent a mental message to both. Excuse me, I wish to speak to Ovis. Cobb looked angry, but before he could reply, Ovis spoke up. Of course, I would love to speak to you, my good friend Mud. Sorry, Mr. Cod, but we'll have to talk another time. Bye. Before Cod could recover, she grabbed Mud by the hand and led him to another empty spot in the room. Once clear, Ovis turned towards Mud, a carefree look on her face. Mud wondered momentarily if the demi-human had any other expression. Maybe her face was broken. It probably wasn't worth asking about for now. Instead, Mud asked a question it had approached her for. Novus, I have no data on my first opponent. Its name is Navus. Please supply me with relevant data. Navus, you say? Novus looked around the room for a moment, then pointed towards a human girl clutching a sword and shield to her chest. Her light leather armor looked new and barely used, aside from the armor and weapon. The girl looked more like a civilian than in nearly anyone else in the room. She was clearly a native of Garthaeus. Her knuckles were white from the time tightly she clung to the shield, and she seemed to be shaking slightly. I think she's in over her head. Ovis shook her head slightly and frowned. Oh, a frown! So her face isn't broken! She probably joined the tournament to prove something, either to herself or others. Unfortunately, she's so new I can't give you any specific advice. Just do your best. By the end, Ovis's face had returned to a normal, aloof grin. Perhaps this first match would be unexpectedly simple. It was to be expected that these matches would get more difficult over the course of the tournament of the structure, statistically speaking. So, it was better to overestimate the enemy than underestimate them. As such, Mud focused its attention to analyze the human Navis. The size, coverage of the shield, the length of the sword, her expected reach, all of it was carefully calculated by Mud's mechanical mind. Before long, Mud was confident that it fully understood her range of movement. Next, Mud began simulating what kinds of attacks she could make if she used a rapid movement skill Mud had seen the other swordsmen use. Mathematics skill has increased to level 5. Mud had also used mathematics to extrapolate the movements of slimes previously, and it had been moderately successful. While the results weren't perfect, the amorphous body structure of the slimes had complicated matters greatly. Against a human, the result should be much more pronounced. Group contestants, please follow me. The arena employee yelled over the murmur of the waiting room. While not as finely dressed as Cantor, the regular employees wore a prim outfit of grey slacks and a buttoned white shirt, along with a dark blue bow tie. Mud found it liked these outfits nearly as much as the tuxedo. Eight individuals filed towards the door, including Novice and Mud itself. The employees guided the group down to the hall and, after a sharp turn, out into the large open space. Above and the open sky could be seen, Cheering crowds pulled the hard stone seats in all directions. Eight square rings had been traced out in the dirt floor of the open space in two rows of four. From the different tunnel, another group was led, first round of the adult competition. In the middle of one long end of the stands, level with the bottom row, an ornate viewing box stood out. Within sat Mayor Guy Fallow and leader Thagi Cool, along with several other individuals that Mud did not recognize. Strangely, one of them was staring directly at Mud, an older woman with glasses and gray hair. The arena employee began directing the combatants to specific squares. Ring 3, Novus Red, Mud Blue. Mud entered the ring and stood on the blue X shape, copying the actions of the previous two rings' combatants. Novus likewise stood on the red X. Her face seemed much paler now, and her knees were shaking slightly. Was this her combat stance? Her hunched and lower posture reminded Mud somewhat of a lowered stance Mal and Kim had taken when Mud spied on them in the forest. Mud was distracted from the examinations as the booming voice of Thagikor cut the arena, silencing the crowd. 
Welcome to the first ever Gothia Dungeon Wave Festival Tournament. End of chapter. And that, my friends, concludes this video. I hope that you enjoyed. If you did, please consider supporting the author from the link down below. Otherwise, if you wish to support this channel, there are numerous ways to do so, like liking, subscribing, and possibly even becoming a patron. Otherwise, the easiest way would be to share. And until the next video, I hope that you all have a good one, and I'll see you then. Cheers.